one of the greatest lies in world history is that America is a racist country. America is the least racist, multi-ethnic, multi-racial country in history. The only non-black country to ever elect a black leader. To get Brexit. Make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun. And in this week's Burning Questions, I interviewed Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager is the founder of Prager University, a conservative platform. And we're going to be talking about the Black Lives Matter protests, George Floyd, and the idea of white privilege and whether our society is institutionally racist. So I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, Dennis Prager. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. George Floyd was killed by a white police officer. How does that make you feel? Uh, I, I am one who assumes that evil uh, is on earth. We will never rid ourselves completely of it. And that is how it makes me feel. It, I am not shocked. Uh, on the other hand, I, am, I do believe that the reaction has been irrational and uh, even evil. Uh, so that's my reaction. Do you, su do you support specifically the peaceful protesters? If support means agree with them, no. If support means that they have the right to protest, of course, that's a cherished value in America freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. Uh, but I believe that one of the greatest lies in world history is that America is a racist country. America is the least racist, multi-ethnic, multi-racial country in history. The only non-black country to ever elect a black leader. The relations between blacks and whites in America on a daily basis are entirely normal. Uh, and this, uh, this is a horrible libel on America causing terrible damage. We've seen thousands of people across America peacefully protesting, but we've also seen riots and looting and the burning down of cities. We've seen curfews throughout uh, American cities for the last week or so. Some people are saying that this is a precursor to a, a, a revolution, uh, that this is the end of capitalism, that this is the end of Western society. And we're actually seeing these protests morph outside of America. In London today, uh, we saw police being attacked by protesters outside of Downing Street, Black Lives Matter supporters. Do you see this as a precursor to some kind of revolution? Do you see this as the end of days? Uh, uh, do you see this sort of event as the end of days, or ends of Western civilization, rather? I do believe that uh, the left, and I always, always draw a distinction, at least in American terms, between left and liberal. Liberals are my allies, though I am called a conservative. Philosophically, they are my allies. Some liberals are awakening to the fact that conservatives are their allies, the left is their enemy. The left loathes Western civilization. It, uh, the notion that there is a, any value system that is superior to any other is loathsome to the left. All value systems are equal. I do not accept that. I think the West has created something better. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It is a value judgment that I make. They don't. The, uh, the idea that all people should be judged by the same standards is anathema to the left. That's why they drop standards uh, for admissions to universities, which I also believe is an insult to black people, but that's another matter. So yes, there is, Western civilization is in crisis all over the West. An entire generation of people raised by people who loathe the West at universities and even secondary schools is very large. It's a very serious problem. And do you think these protests are adding to that problem? I think these protests are a manifestation of that problem. The lack of uh, interference with the looting is a, is a new problem. Not entirely new, it's happened in riots before. To watch uh, police cars burned and the police do nothing is a statement that chaos is, is, is do dominant right now. Chaos. Civilization cannot afford chaos. It usually breeds dictatorships. 
And it's not just the police are holding back. I mean, there are various commentators in America, uh, liberal left-wing media hosts, uh, Chris Cuomo, he's probably one, um, the sort of CNN types and, and even some Democrat politicians who are actually saying that um, these violent protests are a worthy cause because, and this is the reason they give, and I want you to sort of um, break down, first of all, why are people saying these violent protests are acceptable? And second of all, their reasoning is that they say that society has ignored this group of people. They have ignored black Americans for far too long and they can't get their voices heard. So they feel that the only way that they can be heard is by doing the actions that they've been taking in the last week. This is the justification for all political violence. The, uh, the Palestinians said they couldn't be heard unless they blew up children on buses in Israel. Th this is not new. Uh, I am, I, my cause is so good that it is, it's almost an ubermensch cause. I, I am no longer bound by laws of civility because my cause is so noble. It's despicable. And I suppose it's that, that key point there you talk about no longer being bound by the laws of uh, society. Now, that, that goes back to my, my original question is of whether this is sort of the meaning of the end or, or whether this is the end of society is in that if we don't respect our laws, if we don't respect uh, and even encourage people to break those laws, as I mentioned, um, does that just simply lead to the collapse of the way that we live our lives? And do you see that happening in the short term? I, I think your generation is is, is inheriting uh, chaos, and uh, you need to understand what's at stake. With all its flaws, and of course there are flaws because the human being is so flawed, given how flawed humans are, the achievement of West of the West abolishing slavery, giving women equal rights, giving everyone the vote, uh, uh, complete free freedom of speech. These are the aberrations, not to mention elevating people financially, uh, giving people opportunities that they never had in history, more health care than they've ever had in history. These are the aberrations of history. That's not the norm. Freedom is an aberration, not a norm. So uh, I, I am worried, yes, uh, but your generation has already been indoctrinated. And they, the culprits are never, are never noted. In America, the, the people burning the stores and looting are never called leftists. But if they were conservatives doing this, all you would hear is rightists destroy Minneapolis, rightists destroy Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. But no one is saying leftists are destroying. So it, it, it's like some people don't want to acknowledge that on 9-11, America was attacked by Islamic terrorists. So they just say 9-11, America was attacked, but they don't say by whom. Nobody is saying who is doing all of this destruction. It's all coming from the left. The left is a destructive force. But if your generation doesn't recognize that, uh, you will inherit chaos, not order. And in fact, we've seen some in the media. I think I saw a New York Times article talking about uh, how actually many of these rioters and looters are in fact white supremacists and uh, far right types. How do you respond to that? It's a lie. It's a grand lie. But uh, as I have said, and I've studied the left since uh, graduate school, uh, truth is not a left-wing value. For two years, they lied that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. It was a 100% lie. It was found out to be a lie, and then they went to the next lie. White supremacists are doing these demonstrations on behalf of blacks. <laughs> a little bizarre. Let's talk about the nub of the issue of why so many people are angry. And you have to admit that many people are angry. I think this has really struck a chord with millions around uh, at least the Western world. Um, let's talk about Black Lives Matter and police brutality. First of all, do you believe that there is a problem in America uh, with police brutality towards specifically black people, towards African Americans? And if so, what should be done about it? I believe there was. 
there's no doubt in my mind, I believe that police departments overwhelmingly have fought this to the point where what you have now, it's called in America the Ferguson effect. In Ferguson, Missouri, a policeman killed a young man, Michael Brown, and it came out in court that in fact Brown had attacked him. The policeman begged him to stand still. Uh, yet Barack Obama, the New York Times editorial page, and others still say Ferguson as if it's an example of police brutality. But it, these were blacks on the jury that acquitted the policeman uh, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. It it was it was nothing at all based on race. I think that the, the issue of police brutality to blacks is wildly inflated and exaggerated, just as the whole issue of racism in America. If you say anything, if I am opposed, for example, to a lowering standards at universities to admit more blacks or Hispanics or any other group. I believe standards have to be standards. And, it, and by the way, the standards benefit not whites, they benefit Asians. Asians score higher and they get, they are the, the most highly overrepresented group uh, at, the, at the prestigious universities. So be it. Uh, uh, what good is it to lower standards? Uh, uh, and, and then what happens is the blacks get into colleges that make more demands, demands than they are capable of meeting at that time, having nothing to do with their being black. I couldn't have met it when I was in, in, in an undergraduate. I was ready to do hard work in graduate school. I went to Columbia, but I, I couldn't have gone to Columbia as an undergraduate. I'd have probably flunked out. I simply wasn't ready for such intense uh, work, scholastic academic work. But anyway, what happens is then they go, many of them don't graduate, many of them get uh, poor grades, and then they get angry that it's a, a racist university. If, uh, I'll, I'll give you another example. The universities are said to be uh, a, a rape, uh, what is the word? Um, uh, rape, rape, not rape centers, but rape whatever. Rape culture, is that what it is? Yeah, rape culture, that's right, rape culture. And so, of course, that's another great lie, and uh, it's simply proved what parent would send a daughter to a rape culture. Everyone knows it's a lie, but the left continues with it. So what it, the lie of, of, uh, of police brutality, it exists, but it is, not a, it is not an epidemic. All bad things exist, but, the, but this, is, this is not huge. The, the, the sort of Black Lives Matter movement around the world points to Western slavery, points to the fact that uh, black people weren't given civil rights as, as quickly uh, as, as white people, um, and points to various acts of racism, uh, which they say are still in America today and still institutionally in not just America, but in Britain and the Western world today. So my question is, do you believe that we live in an institutionally racist society? Whenever a caller to my show, a black caller, I do an American radio show three hours a day. And whenever a black calls in, or for that matter, a white leftist, America is uh, institutionally racist. I ask, what institution? I mean, it, it means nothing until I hear the institution. So what happened today? A black caller from Alabama called my show and said that. And I said, what institution? He said, the, the justice system. Because uh, the argument is given that blacks are disproportionately in prison. But the reason blacks are disproportionately in prison is because they disproportionately commit violent crime. These are FBI statistics. This has nothing to do with anti or pro-black. It's anti or pro-truth. That, that's the issue. That uh, It's a tragedy, and uh, I have theories as to why, but it doesn't matter. That's not why you asked me. There are more blacks in prison because more blacks proportionally commit violent crime. And, and in, in terms of interracial crime, the, a white person's chance of being murdered or beaten by a black are so much greater than a, a black person's chances of being murdered or beaten by a white. I want to talk later about some of the reasons uh, that you believe 
uh, black people face so many of these issues, for example, and you mentioned one there, more black people, obviously, um, many more black people proportionally in America are in prisons, more black people, black people are more likely to be shot than white people by police proportionally, uh, and they're more likely to be arrested for drug usage, for example. Uh, we'll talk about the, the reasons that you think are behind uh, those statistics later on. And obviously the main reason that most leftists or left-wing types in America and Britain would say that actually the reasons for, for those for those awful statistics would be uh, systemic racism. But we'll talk, talk about later, as I say, to why to why you think uh, that that occurs. I want to talk about the idea of white privilege. Now, many people would say to you, Dennis Prager, as a white man, you have no right or no understanding to talk about the issues that we've been talking about because you can never understand what it's like to experience racism as a black person. You can never understand those experience, so experiences. So how can you uh, have any authority to talk about any of these issues? I, I must admit, I never understood that argument that if you are not part of a group, you may not have any uh, opinions on anything in reference to the group. I'm not a woman, uh, but I, I feel that I can comment on women's issues. Uh, I'm a Jew, I think I can comment on Christian issues. I mean, uh, I'm very tall, can I not talk about what it is to be short? Uh, I, this is like a, a, a war against knowledge. If you are not X, then you have no valid statement to say about X. Then really the truth is no one can say anything about anything except themselves. But even that's not accurate because most people really don't know themselves very well. That's why people go to therapists, theoretically, to learn about themselves. So what, what this argument is ultimately reductio ad absurdum. You have reduced it to absurdity. There is, there are truths. Do I, I, do I not, can I not emote with a black? You can't emote with yourself. Uh, I, I had back surgery, it was terrible pain. I can't even emote to that pain now. When you're out of pain, you don't remember what pain is like. So the issue of do, can you emote is, is, is irrelevant, is, is what you have to say worthwhile. And what about the blacks who agree with me? Why, why are they dismissed? Joe Biden is running for president of the United States and says that if you don't vote Democrat, you ain't black. He said that last week. That's incredible. Anyway, why don't they say, who are you, Joe Biden, to tell blacks how to vote? You're not black. I was on Spotify last night trying to listen to some music and it came up with a Black Lives Matter playlist. Um, on Twitter today, there was a headline that says, Ben and Jerry's calls for a, mis a, a dismantling of white supremacy. I think Pop-Tart, another American brand, was tweeting about uh, Black Lives Matter. Why are so many uh, capitalist brands, why are so many big companies getting involved in this movement? because they're cowards. The, the default character characteristic of the human is cowardice. It takes a lot to be courageous. So companies think I have nothing to lose if I sound woke. And that's why they do it. That's all it is. It, the, the, the left can intimidate, the right cannot. That's the fact of life today. And it's a tragedy, but uh, big businesses run like universities are by cowards, by cowardly people, because that's the norm. Uh, if uh, I just read Wendy's, this fast food chain, burger chain in America, the, the owner gave a few hundred thousand dollars to the Trump campaign. There's a massive campaign now on the left to get people not to have Wendy's. There's no campaign on the right not to eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We, we understand that you have positions, big deal. Do you make a good ice cream? That's not what the left does. If we disagree with you, you must be suppressed. I run Prager University. I'm Prager. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the attempt to suppress us on the, on the uh, internet uh, is, uh, is very scary. 
the left does not argue. The left suppresses. The protesters uh, are obviously absolutely uh, distraught about the death of George Floyd. There's this awful nine minute video watching him slowly uh, suffocate to death with a police officer's uh, knee on his neck. And I think that that made everyone angry. I mean, other than a very, very small minority of people all around the world, um, people could see that as a human being, you know, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. Um, that video was completely distressing and uh, just absolutely horrible. And I, I don't think there's been, I, I haven't seen any mainstream commentator on the left or right say that George Floyd's death wasn't any of the things that I've just said it described it as. Um, and basically, you know, even President Trump, for example, is saying George Floyd's death was a disaster, it was a murder, and we're glad that the police officer involved has been arrested and will be charged. So therefore, my question comes to what are the what do the protesters want? If we all basically agree with the fundamental premise of George Floyd's death was a disaster and that the police officer should be arrested and tried, then what comes after that? That's a fine question. Look, there's so little racism in America that the University of California and your viewers, readers, listeners can check this out. There's a list that the, the largest state university is California because it's the largest of the states. I live in California. They put out a list of what they call microaggressions, things people say that they think are not racist but really are. So here's an example. If you say, in my opinion, there's only one race, the human race, that is officially designated as racist. Now, of course, it's the least racist comment you can come out with. You don't, the only race you care about is the human race, means it doesn't matter what color you are. It's irrelevant, you're human. But that is now considered racist. Why? Because there's so little racism that the left has to invent statements and actions that that will now be, be called racist. That's how little racism there is. I am fortunate enough to have a relatively small platform compared to yours, admittedly, um, but I, I'm able to interview people like you all around the world and, and reach millions of people. Therefore, I think it would be a dereliction of my duty not to mention, as I've mentioned so much, the death of George Floyd, which, as I said, is a complete disaster, not to mention a man called David Dorn. David Dorn was a black man, or is a black man. Uh, he was a police uh, captain. He served in his community with the police force for 38 years. Um, he was looked up to in the community. And during the rioting and looting yesterday, uh, he went down to just defend a, a store of a friend and he was tragically shot and killed, murdered by the rioters and the looters. Do you think that there has been equal outrage over his death to George Floyd? And if not, why not? This, because the news is not news. The news is an attempt to achieve a mission. And so if the news does not, is not reconcilable with a left-wing view of the world, it is under or even not reported. That would be an example uh, of, I, I know about that story, and that is indeed an example of what is or isn't reported. Uh, blacks in, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, on many occasions have beaten up religious Jews who are identifiable by their clothing, and they would beat them up. There are videos of this on the internet. There is no national outcry. Uh, yet the Anti-Defamation League, group, uh, which is the anti-anti-Semitism group that Jews have created, routinely, and it's, and it's liberal of the ADL, it's not conservative, uh, but they routinely report that there's more anti-Semitism in the black community than any other community in America. But that, that gets no news, it, it's not reported. Some Democrats and members of the media have been describing President Trump recently as a dictator, and they've done this before over the last uh, three or four years as he's been president. Now, obviously, he has used very strong language against these protesters. He's called them thugs. 
First of all, do you agree with the sentiment that, that Trump is becoming a dictator, that he is authoritarian, that he is this hard man figure? And second well, of all, do uh, you... forgive me. For, for, first, I just have to go I for think, it. I think correct you. He did not call the protesters thugs. He called the looters thugs. That's a, that's an important distinction. And you're right. I'm, I apologize for not getting the, the wording on that quite correct. I think you're right that, he, as you say, he called the, the looters thugs. So the first the first part of the question was, first of all, do you agree with this, this sentiment that Trump is becoming um, an authoritarian figure? And second of all, do you think this kind of rhetoric simply goes further to fuel the chaos in America? It's it's almost a joke to call the man a dictator when all the dictators are Democrats. The the governors of Pennsylvania, of Michigan, of Washington, Oregon, my state, California, they're the dictators. You can't go to work. That's a dictator. You can't go to church. That's a dictator. You can't open up your business. That's a dictator. Trump wants them to open up. He's the He's the non-dictator. Also, you never get dictators on the right. Because our view is give government less power. By definition, dictatorship in, in, in Western countries is going to come from the left unless there's some sort of coup somewhere. Because the left wants more power and the right wants less power. It's definitional. You can't be a dictator if you want the government to shrink. Yet, yet the left is truly projection. We want to be dictators and when they can, they are. What has happened now in the United States of America is a scandal. And, and the division is almost completely accurate, left, right. Republican governors say you're free. Democratic governors say you cannot go to work. That, that's, that's an important distinction. When you say there that there can't be dictators on the right, um, I'm going to point you to a couple of examples, and I'm sure you've got lots of points to argue against this. Um, so, for example, Pinochet. Uh, many people on the left would say that this was a right-wing dictator. Um, another example, obviously the one that most people would immediately pop into their head is Adolf Hitler. Um, so when when it's, people make an interesting argument against leftists who say that communism was never tried correctly, all the times it, it's been tried, it hasn't been done properly, are you therefore making a sort of similar proxy argument to say, well, actually, they're not really right-wing uh, they're well, not really right-wing well, because you know, it just using, hasn't been done I, correctly. Remember, I was using Western democracies as my example. Uh, you know, uh, in, in Latin America, were there right-wing dictators? Yes, of course, there were right-wing dictators. Were they elected in a free election? I'm talking about can you elect people who will ultimately create a, a, a dictatorship? There, right now in California, there is a dictatorship. It is not deniable. You can say, well, it's for health reasons, that's fine. But you can't deny the fact that the reality is, this is the point, reality, not theory. I'll get to Hitler in a moment. But the, 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 re, the reality is those governors who are acting like dictators are all Democrat and the ones who are not are all Republican. That's a fact. It's not theoretical. That's what's happening in real life. Now, if you go to Hitler, uh, and I know a great deal about Hitler and about Nazism, uh, uh, it, it's a very honest debate whether to call the man right or not right. First of all, Nazism meant national socialism. Is socialism a right-wing value? No. So uh, if one is intellectually honest, there, there is an element of, of, a strong element of leftism in Nazism, but you can argue it is not just socialism, it was also racism. Yeah, that's correct. Is racist a right-wing doctrine? Okay, that's, that is an interesting question. I, uh, I know a lot of right-wingers, they loathe racism as much as anyone else does. It, it is sui generis. Racism is not right, it is not left. It just is. It's another way of looking at life. It's an evil prism to see the world through race. But I don't know why it is called right. Right-wing means less government, Left wing means more government. That's the essential difference between the two. And America was founded to have limited government. The left wants to undo the American Revolution and make government ever bigger. That's what I mean by you won't have a right wing dictator in America because Republicans and the right want smaller government. I am not saying that in all of Earth and all of history, there can't be a right wing dictator. 
Let's get back to President Trump. Uh, not only was he criticised by CNN, but he was also criticised by Fox News. Uh, Tucker Carlson of Fox News said that Trump didn't go far enough uh, against the protesters. He criticised them also for focusing too much on President Trump himself rather than protecting the American people. He said, he, he said uh, that Trump failed to uh, protect American citizens during these riots. Is he right? Well, the only thing the president could do, to the best of my knowledge, is send in troops. It's a very, uh, the Wall Street Journal, which uh, is the, the great conservative newspaper in the United States, uh, they editorialized that he should not send in troops. Uh, th this would be a bad uh, precedent, even though it has happened on rare occasion in America. And he should rely on National Guard, but I, the National Guard is called in by governors. So uh, I, I read the Tucker Carlson monologue. I thought it was brilliant. And uh, I would, if I've been on his show and I would ask him, well, what would you have liked the president to do? And I think he did say send in troops. I think uh, good conservatives and good Americans uh, can be, uh, on either side of the issue of wh whether you send in the US military. I think the National Guard should have been used, uh, but uh, 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 you, go, you go police, National Guard, then military. In New York City, they didn't even use the police, let alone not call in the National Guard. Believe me, had they been right-wing looters, right-wing arsonists, the police and the National Guard would have been called in. How do you think the media have impacted these riots and protests? Let me tell you my view on this for a moment. Uh, I, I studied the Russian language and the Soviet Union. I was at the Russian Institute at Columbia University for graduate work. And I, I remember thinking, and then I went to the Soviet Union during that time, uh, I remember thinking this could never happen in America, that the press brainwashes people because in a free only in a totalitarian state can the press brainwash people and it's one of the few things one of the few shocking things in my life to learn that the media even in a free society can brainwash people uh, uh, and this uh, look i think the hysteria over covid and it has been hysteria you know, in 1968-69, we lost the equivalent of 150,000 Americans, and people went to Woodstock to dance and, and do other intimate physical gestures. Uh, we are a weaker, so this is all the West, this is all the world, it's UK too. It's not just the United States. But the press played a, a, a huge role uh, in, in fostering panic. And in, in this case, the press, as I said, they don't even identify the ideology of the people who are looting. It's still protest, and it's still this lie that the police and America are, are, are profoundly racist. But the left control the media, and this is the normative message that they wish to give. It's a, it's a, very, uh, it's a very terrible problem. Thank God. There are brilliant and deep and honest voices that are not the mainstream media in the United States, and uh, they, they are a large following. We are one of those with a large following, but uh, Prager you I'm, I'm speaking of, including people in Britain who follow us, but the, uh, they're doing everything they can to suppress us. Uh, 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 Facebook just labeled one of our uh, videos on the number of polar bears uh, as false news. And so anyone who passes that on in Facebook is now a false news purveyor. This is new in, in, in history. That, and by the way, it, I would never pass false news. I, I am a religious person. My deepest value is truth. Scientists differ on the number of polar bears. But you can't say that because it doesn't conform to what the climate change uh, advocates or, or I should say 
hysterics. And I think there is hysteria there. Every 12 years we told, we have 12 years till the earth uh, is existentially destroyed. Uh, Bill Gates just bought a $43 million home on, on the coast. Why would anybody do that if they believe that the, the ocean will inundate their home? Why, why do wealthy people keep buying coastal homes if in 12 years it'll be overrun by water? Um, or, or how about this? How, how can I believe you with regard to the, the need to get off fossil fuel if you don't advocate nuclear power? Nuclear power is, is clean and unbelievably safe. So you don't really believe it. Like uh, the, the horrible thing in, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, we, they use an issue to, to expand government and undo capitalism and whatever else the left wants to do. I want to stick on this, stick with this idea for the media just for now. Um, what PragerU is doing, in my opinion, and this is just my view, is totally revolutionary. Um, you know, as a young person, I'm just 20 years old, um, and I watch, you know, have seen PragerU videos, think they're really interesting and they're really, um, uh, re really easy to consume. Um, and I think uh, th your numbers show this. There is huge demand for alternative media. And in the UK, um, I don't know how closely you follow, I presume not too closely to our, our media, but we're forced to pay £150 every single year to the BBC, which unfortunately is becoming more partisan. It's becoming more like CNN or more like Fox News in America. Um, has this, has, have recent events to do with the pandemic and these protests and riots, have they made you even more determined or more determined than ever to um, go on your mission to educate people, to uh, show that there is an alternative to the mainstream? Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, look, uh, on an emotional and personal level, many years ago, I visited Normandy Beach in France, where the D-Day invasion took place. And when I saw the thousands of crosses, for the dead men, your age, basically, machine gunned, grenaded to death by the Nazi German troops when they invaded Normandy Beach. And I looked at it and I said to myself, and it was very, uh, is a very important moment in my life. These guys died for liberty and for America. I could at least live for liberty and for America. No one's asking me to, to die. And that was a seminal moment in my life. If they could die for my liberty, and that's the issue of liberty, then I can live for it. So yes, uh, I am, as it, will, as it were, I'm double downing, but their attempts to shut us up are, are increasing tremendously with this Facebook false news thing, with YouTube dropping video. YouTube dropped the video, this was not PragerU. YouTube dropped the video of two emergency room physicians in California, physicians, emergency room physicians, who said that the lock, lockdown, this destruction of, of millions of people's lives was not medically necessary, and YouTube took it down. If you put up a, a, a uh, something advocating the use of hydroxychloroquine and zinc, it's taken down, even if you're a doctor. The threat to liberty in America and the West, but I'll speak about America, is the greatest since 1776, and certainly the greatest civil war since the Civil War over slavery. That's how, that's how bad it is. It's, it's literally a battle for liberty. And let me just add one word. Liberty is a value, not a yearning, not an instinct. People do not want liberty nearly as much as they want to be taken care of. That is why the left has so much appeal. Let us make this deal. We take your liberty. We give you lunch. 
And most people will say, fine. To give you context to this question, I want to talk about the rise of PragerU, which is a fantastic example of um, one of these, as I mentioned earlier, alternative uh, media outlets. And we've seen many commentators and media outlets be, been hugely on the rise. We've seen the rise of Jordan Peterson, who sold um, his fantastic book, 12 Rules for Life, to millions of people all over the world. We've seen the rise of figures. Today, I was interviewing Douglas Murray. He's one of them. And what people call, uh, what people describe as the intellectual dark web. Do you think that there has been a backlash against as what you describe the censorship of many of these social media companies and the rise of hyper-partisan media outlets in the, U in the US. And I just wanted to mention as well on the hydrochloricoxin, I can't, I can't pronounce that properly, uh, just on that, on that drug, um, it's turned out today that many of the reports about that have actually been false. I don't know if you've seen this story um, and were published by The Lancet and the New England uh, Medical Journal have actually turned out to be incorrect and false. So when, when YouTube censors these videos and Twitter censors these videos before actually having the proper facts, then people can clearly see uh, what's going on. So do you think that there's been a backlash recently against all of this censorship, et cetera, that we've been talking about? Clearly there's a backlash, but when, if, if, you, ha if you have a backlash against uh, the tube in, in, uh, in London, for whatever reason, they, they've just been incompetent and, and uh, discriminating against people, people by race or whatever, what are you going to do? Build your own tube? Uh, without YouTube, without Google, without Facebook, without Twitter, we can't get our word out. So backlash or no backlash, they have all the cards. Uh, that's, that's the issue to me. Uh, people say often, oh, why doesn't PragerU build, you know, and, and, other, and others who are not on the left build their own web, but then we won't get to everybody. M Prager U gets to a lot of people and gets you to think a, a, twice because you've only been given one version of events and of life. So, uh, yes, I mean, you mentioned people I adore. You know, Douglas Murray, he's made a Prager U video. Jordan Peterson has made a Prager U video. These are spectacular people, by the way. These are courageous, brilliant people. And it, the, the proof of the need to shut us up is they don't debate us. Uh, uh, it is remarkable. They don't even, I have a national radio show with millions of listeners. They won't come on. And I, I'm, I'm known for treating people I differ with, with great respect. I'm not there to humiliate them, but they won't come on anyway. We would love to go on their shows, but they will not come on our shows. They suppress, they don't the debate. They just throw a label, false news, uh, um, a racist, or, or what have you. So uh, there, there is a huge repository of intellect that is not on the left. Jordan Peterson is a phenomenon, and, and he, he's not a political man. It all started because in Canada, he just said, you know, it's not, you, you can't by law tell me how to refer to people. And, and he's right, that, that, that what does the law have to do with whether I call you he or she, or, or, or it or Z, or, or what, or, or they, all these alternatives. In, in the United States, if you say men cannot give birth, you are considered a bigot. I'm serious. I'm sure, I know it's in Britain too. For whatever reason, the English-speaking countries are the worst right now. Australia, New Zealand, the U.S., Canada, Britain, it is, it, I don't know why. It's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that if you say men cannot give birth in France, they're not going to attack you. But, that's, uh, that's, that's really it, interesting. It, it is interesting. I, and I, I don't know the reason for it, but it, the Anglo-Saxon, if you will, or the English-speaking countries are right now uh, the, the most suppressive of speech. One of the groups that have been uh, adding to the chorus uh, shouting Black Lives Matter and America is an institutionally racist country is in fact another country, and that is China, communist China to be specific. Um, first of all, do you, th do you find this ironic? And second of all, do you think this is part of um, uh, the Chinese, a Chinese attempt 
to embolden their power across the Western world and, and around the world, in fact. You're referring to when they call America racist? Correct. They've been... Uh, yeah, uh, the Soviets used to do that all the time. Of course, if, if you were... They had, there were no blacks in the Soviet Union. So it, it's very easy not to be racist if you're all, you know, monochrome. Uh, uh, I did not know that China is now calling the U.S. racist. But it is exactly an echo of what the Soviets did. It is to deflect uh, from their oppression of their own people. What, what, they, what they're doing to Muslims uh, in, in China is obviously an example. Uh, the, the organ harvesting of prisoners that they do there, it's a horrible regime. And uh, I, I pray, I really, I mean, to the extent I don't tend to pray in this way, but figuratively, I pray that humanity will awaken to the threat that the communist Chinese regime poses to, uh, to civilization. And by the way, directly to Hong Kong, I, I mean, you know, the only mistake I think Margaret Thatcher ever made was honoring the agreement to give Hong Kong to China. It, I, I was, you know, a young guy, but I knew it's inconceivable they will allow Hong Kong to stay free. They would be, it would be unprecedented in the history of communism. And that's what they're now trying to do, essentially incorporate it into Chinese law and suppression. I also, the, the most interesting question will be if they do something militarily against Taiwan, how will the West react? I, I, I believe that it is worth making a war over Taiwan. Uh, I, I am among those who believe the famous phrase of the American Revolution, give me liberty or give me death. I, I, want, I want to, I'd rather die standing than live on my knees or some, something like that. So this is a very big problem, the communist Chinese government, which of course unleashed this virus on the world. I'm not saying intentionally, but, but it was unleashed from there. The point you made about Margaret Thatcher is, is one that I've never really thought about. And it's an interesting uh, observation. Uh, many people point to the actions of, for example, Bill Clinton, who uh, was so eager to uh, accept the China into the World Trade Organization and obviously various US presidents and British leaders and world, you know, Western leaders um, made various attempts over the last few decades to uh, open up China's markets to Western markets. Um, so how much, how much do you put blame at the, the door of Western leaders as to the situation we now have with China being one of the most powerful countries on earth? People believe what they want to believe. That's, they, don't, they don't believe something because it's true nearly as much as because they want to believe it. So this truly foolish doctrine arose. If we bring China into the world economic community, uh, their prosperity and their being with the West will clearly and inevitably make them a freer country. This, this is, there's no basis for that belief. They said that with Iran. Let's, let's bring them into the world community and then they, they, you know, they'll, they'll just westernize a bit. There is no, it never happens. You have to confront evil. You cannot accommodate it. But uh, I know that I'm, I am talking into the wind when I say that. People don't like to confront. So I want, my favorite verse from the Bible is those who love God must hate evil. People don't hate evil. You know who they hate? The people who fight evil. You've done a lot of research on the Soviet Union, uh, which, is, which is a really interesting uh, case. Communist China um, obviously was around at the same time of the Soviet Union. Uh, under Chairman Mao, tens of millions of Chinese people uh, died of starvation and through other um, d just horrible ways that the regime unfortunately uh, enacted on its own people. Yet the the reaction from uh, the West to China and the reaction from the West to the Soviet Union was so vastly different. 
Why? They, we, we in the West assume the Soviet Union posed a potentially existential threat with their nuclear capability. And they were so, uh, they were so much more advanced economically than China, there was a fear that they could make a war. Nobody thought Mao could make a war on the West. He could, as you pointed out, I believe it's about 60 million people. Some say 80 million people. I mean, some scholars. What he did to his own people is, is beyond belief. But that's the reason. There was no real fear of China in the international arena. So the focus, you're quite right, was on the Soviet Union. I want to finish the interview by asking a question uh, about religion. Um, it's a bit of a cheeky question, so forgive me. Uh, you're, you're a deeply religious man, um, uh, and the President of the United States recently did a photo op with a Bible outside of a church. Uh, he was, President Trump was, was interviewed about religion. He was asked, what is your favourite Bible verse? He couldn't name one. Uh, he was asked, what was your favourite uh, you know, what was your favorite version of the Bible? Was it the New Testament or the Old Testament? He said, uh, I think I'd have to go for both of them equally. Do you feel that he is a religious man? It's not my business to determine that. I'm, and I never evade questions. I don't, I don't care if he's an atheist or, or a firm believer. The f I care that people understand that without God and the Bible, America will sink, not because God will punish us. I don't believe in, I think that's nonsense. The United States was founded on limited government. The founders understood the following. People are not basically good. That's the most important thing people have to understand. If you think human nature is good, then it's dialogue becomes silly. We, we perceive the world 180 degrees opposite. Human nature is not good. I don't say it's pure evil, it's good in human nature, but human nature is not good. So to be free, people have to, have to be controlled. Men have to be controlled because un, unchecked, they will murder and they will rape. That's just the way life is. So, so we have to get men to be good and women to be good. And the founders said, look, we have a choice. The government can control people or God can control people. So the only way to get government small is to make God big. And as God has gotten smaller in Western life, Britain, US, France, it doesn't matter. Governments have gotten bigger. That's the way it works. Secularism breeds big government because somebody has to fill the gap that the absence of God has made. We, in America, it was an amazing group of people. They said, God wants us to be free. On the Liberty Bell, the iconic symbol of the American Revolution is, is one thing written, and it's from the Bible, from the Old Testament. Leviticus 25.10, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. They tied God and freedom together. If we get rid of God in American life, we will end up less free. Trump in some way understands this. Whether he believes in God or not, therefore, is irrelevant to me. I much rather have an agnostic president who understands the need for God and Bible in America to a religious president who doesn't understand that need. And on that, thank you very much, Dennis Prager, for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Truly my pleasure. Thank you.